I'd like to tell you today, as best I can in 45 minutes in non-technical terms, the story of how scientists, with a very key contribution from Henry Kendall, as you'll see, figured out some of nature's deepest and most beautiful secrets. <coughs> In 1931, after two decades or so of the most remarkable progress in physics uh, in all of history, the model of atoms that we still use today emerged. This was the era of quantum mechanics. And the, the model of atoms that arose was that atoms consist of a positively charged nucleus, where most, which is very small, and which is where most of the mass of the particle of the atom uh, is concentrated, surrounded by a cloud of electrons, which are all negatively charged, and fill up a big space. And, uh, I've tried to crudely, in a cartoon fashion, indicate here that they're both waves and particles. But I won't uh, even attempt to explain that uh, here. This is not drawn to scale. And the atom, of course, is much smaller. In fact, uh, the nucleus has a size of about 10 to the minus 13 centimeters, which is very, very small. Uh, not only in absolute terms, but even compared to the size of atoms. Atoms are about 10,000 or 100,000 times larger than the nucleus inside. Since for most purposes you can consider atoms as the indivisible units of matter, and certainly in chemistry uh, they're so considered, uh, it's very difficult to probe the inside of atoms using chemical or ordinary means. One needs to go to some extraordinary lengths to probe the inside of atoms. And it's, a, it's, I think, a miracle, even in retrospect, that it could be done and figured out. But in 1931, when the problem of understanding the inside of the atom, the nucleus, really took its modern shape, it was appropriate to draw it as it's drawn here, as a black box. Then. The first breakthrough in understanding what this black box consisted of was made by one of the people in this picture, James Chadwick. Uh, you can probably guess which one it is. I'll give you a hint. It's the one who looks very satisfied with himself. <laughs> <laughs> For as Chadwick uh, discovered the elementary particle called the neutron. And with that discovery, it became clear that the nucleus of atoms could be considered as made up out of two, out of two basic building blocks, two more elementary building blocks, protons and neutrons. Protons had been known before, although not uh, their essential nature, as the uh, nuclei of hydrogen atoms. But neutrons were, are unsta single neutrons are unstable and had to be discovered many, many, many years later uh, by Chadwick in 1931. 32, Maurice tells me. <laughs> it won't be essential for what follows. <laughs> so at that time, in 1931 or two, uh, the problem of understanding protons and neutrons rose to the top of the physics agenda. Physicists had understood atoms, at least in principle. And uh, the, the frontier was to understand this deep inside, this deeply mysterious black box of uh, very small uh, and seemingly inaccessible, the, the atomic nuclei. Mm. It soon became clear that essentially new physical laws would be involved in understanding atomic nuclei. 
and in particular what held them together. The known forces at that time, the gravitational and the electric forces, clearly wouldn't do the job. The electric forces, in fact, would tend to make the nuclei blow apart because uh, like charges attract, and I'm sorry, like charges repel, and one has lots of positively charged protons, and the neutrons have no electric charge at all. And, and gravity is just much too weak, acting on such small amounts of matter. So uh, a basically new force was realized to be involved and got to be called the strong force because it's the strongest force in nature. It takes the strongest force in nature to pull the, pull, make these particles uh, against the will of electromagnetism congregate together in a very, very small volume. So to figure out what these forces were, first people uh, just collided protons and neutrons and tried to measure how they deflected each other and from that infer what the forces were. And what resulted from those uh, efforts over many years by many physicists was that the forces were extraordinarily complicated. People were perhaps hoping that they'd find some simple analog of the 1 over r squared forces that characterize gravity or electromagnetism, but they found instead complicated forces that seemed to depend on distance in a complicated way, depended on how the particles were spinning, on the, on all, on, uh, on the energy in a complicated way, and just didn't seem to be simple at all. So uh, they had the bright idea of trying to uh, look inside the protons themselves, or somehow find substructure in the protons, and hoping, I guess, or just, just to find out what was going on, but hoping, I suppose, to uh, find simplicity in some uh, smaller bits out of which protons were made. Just as the forces between atoms are very complicated, but reflect the fact that in atoms you have many electrons interacting all together, and that gives you chemistry out of fundamental, fundamentally simple interactions between individual electrons. But if the hope was for finding something uh, simple by banging the protons and neutrons together and finding simpler things coming out, the result was a nightmare. Because what you find when you collide protons or neutrons at high energy is that more comes out than went in. So instead of things getting simpler, you find out this completely novel situation in physics that you get the same stuff plus more, and things get, instead of simpler, uh, nightmarishly more complicated. This is really uh, E equals mc squared writ backwards. One is accustomed to thinking of E equals mc squared as the uh, obtaining of energy from mass in a nuclear explosion, say, you bring together some uh, nuclei, they lose a little bit of mass and energy is released. Here uh, we get to read the equation in the opposite way. We put in a lot of energy, protons moving really fast to each other, and we can get out more mass than we started with. So typic a typical result when you collide protons at high energy might be that you collide two protons and out comes not anything simpler, but four protons, an antiproton, and even new particles that weren't known before, anti-lambdas and Ks, and many, many more. And soon, one had extensive tables, the so-called Rosenfeld tables, of all the various unstable particles that could, be emer that could emerge from proton collisions, in addition to protons themselves. So uh, this is, well, particle physicists in those days used to carry around something called the particle data book, which was conveniently made in wallet size uh, form and came with a magnifying glass. And it contained mm, roughly 100 pages like this of uh, data about all the different particles that, that uh, were known. Through a series of uh, ingenious deductions and brilliant uh, 
leaps, some order was brought to this uh, chaos of particles. And it was realized that one could, uh, determ one could uh, rationalize their properties in terms of a few simpler configurations of hypothetical substructures. That is, all these different particles could be understood as being different uh, realizations of a few basic configurations of a, smaller num a much smaller number of particles. The smaller number of particles are, the, are the, were called quarks. And the different kinds of particles that were observed were mesons, which consists of a quark. And you see this, is this thing, which is a missing quark, is an anti-quark. Or out of three quarks, which make a so-called baryon, or a three anti-quarks. I didn't want to draw these complicated things three times. These are the anti-baryons made out of uh, three anti-quarks. And then there were th three different kinds of quarks, up, down, and strange. And by having the quarks move in different ways or be uh, uh, vibrating in different ways, one could account for the vast number of particles that were observed. Many people contributed to this picture, but perhaps the most uh, numerous contributions were made by this fellow, uh, which is, who's Murray, that's Murray Gelman. And he'll, he'll play a role in a joke to come. <coughs> <laughs> But although this rationalized uh, the vast proliferation of particles to a certain extent, there was a very big weakness in this modeling. No quarks. <laughs> you had sometimes a quark and an anti-quark, sometimes three quarks, sometimes three anti-quarks, but never a single quark and certainly no theory of the forces. In fact, they'd have to be some very, very peculiar forces so that quarks couldn't get out even though uh, they were in. <laughs> and uh, of course, I've simplified the story. This fact that the quarks weren't observed and that there was no theory of the forces that might hold them together uh, made some people skeptical. <laughs> and there were various competing ideas, in fact, and there was a lot of frustration. This was the period when uh, some physicists got involved in uh, analogies with uh, Buddhism and Hinduism and the Tao of physics and the early days of string theory and other things. <laughs> <laughs> In retrospect, it's clear that what was missing was the right tool. And uh, this turned out to be the right tool to clarify the situation. This is the uh, two-mile linear accelerator at SLAC. Uh, if you, or it is SLAC, I'm sorry, at Stanford. Uh, wherever it is. And uh, if you notice the change in topography there, this is cleverly uh, built over the San Andreas Fault. <laughs> <laughs> but, it's, but it's accurately linear. <laughs> uh, it's no longer over the San Andreas Fault, I'm, I'm told. <laughs> Uh, here it is uh, in, in a late, with later editions and uh, in color from the web. <laughs> and using this tool, which I'll explain a little bit in a moment, three heroes, uh, Professor Taylor, who's in the audience today, and Professor Friedman, who I believe is in the audience also, and uh, Professor Kendall, who we've been uh, remembering and honoring today, along with many others, but uh, sp they spearheaded the experiments that uh, took uh, 
the understanding of the strong interaction to a new level. Basically, this new instrument is a very sophisticated form of microscope. You see, to study the structure of atoms, let alone uh, atomic nuclei, using ordinary light is totally insufficient. Ordinary light has a wavelength which is much, much larger than the, the atom, let alone the nucleus. And so uh, when you try to see it, it's like, uh, well, it's, it can't be done. <laughs> <laughs> the resolution is just too poor. Those of us over a certain age will know what it means. <laughs> uh, you need short wavelengths to uh, resolve small structures. And to get sufficiently short wavelength photons, that translates into very high energies and very large momentum transfers. And the way to produce such photons such, is to uh, accelerate electrons and allow them to collide with other charged particles. Those collisions are mediated by so-called virtual, virtual photons whose, whose energy and momentum and wavelength you can infer from how much the electron is deflected. And by sophisticated analysis of uh, these scattering events, you can employ these photons as a uh, precise tool to look inside the protons and neutrons. And what Taylor, Friedman, Kendall, and their associates found when they looked deep inside uh, protons and neutrons was that there were smaller things inside that seemed to have very simple structure where the charge was concentrated. So the protons and neutrons were not cloudy objects with a distribution of charge, but objects with little pellets of charge inside. This interpretation of what they were finding was pioneered by uh, this fellow, Professor uh, Feynman, and also by Professor Bjorkane, who's in the audience. Feynman called the things inside protons partons. This, and he had a simple and bold theory that partons should be very, very simple and use them to analyze uh, the results of these experiments uh, successfully. Feynman and Gelman were great rivals. They were both professors at Caltech. And uh, Gelman hated partons. Especially, mainly he hated the word. Of course, he didn't hate partons. But he didn't hate. <laughs> uh, my first, and I can tell a little personal story here. Uh, my first, in, one of my first experiences in physics and my first encounter with uh, Gelman was in Aspen in the summer of 1973. And being a young and naive student, I made the mistake of mentioning that I was working on partons. <laughs> And uh, I was treated to an unbelievable tirade. Oh, partons? Partons? What are, what are partons? Oh, you mean put-ons? Put-ons? Those things Feynman talks about? They're just quarks, you know. There's no such thing. <laughs> OK. <laughs> so uh, Gelman also has a license plate on that, that says quarks, one of these vanity plates. So that very night, I cut out a piece of cardboard in the plate in the, in the in the uh, shape of a license plate, I wrote partons and stuck it on. <laughs> <laughs> Unfortunately, I think the wind blew. I don't, I'm not sure if he ever saw it. Uh, uh, anyway, um, to be fair, uh, Murray wasn't the only one who had trouble with partons. Because the interpretation Feynman was using was assuming that these particles inside, whatever they were, had very, very uh, simple, ideally, ideally simple properties. In fact, too damn simple. 
They couldn't be reconciled with other things we knew about the general principles of quantum mechanics. This is a little bit subtle, but please bear with me because it's really the heart of the story. Why do I say these particles shouldn't be uh, or couldn't be too simple? And it was paradoxical that they seemed to be as simple as they were. Well, it goes back to a phenomenon that we learn about in elementary electromagnetism and has been known since the 19th century, that if you have particles that charge particles in a medium, there's a phenomenon of screening. So for instance, if you have positively charged particles, put a positively charged particle inside a medium that contains polarizable molecules, uh, the molecules will tend to deform. The negative parts of the molecule will move towards, will be electrically attracted towards the positive uh, test charge all over. And as a result, that charge will tend to be neutralized. This is what we call screening. So the charge you see if you're far away in a medium is partially canceled by the medium itself and you see a smaller charge, we say. Or conversely, if you go closer and closer and look finer and finer, you should see a bigger and bigger charge. Well, what does that have to do with uh, scattering of elementary particles, which after all don't seem to be in a medium? Well, actually, in our modern understanding of uh, quantum theory, em so-called empty space really is a medium. There are quantum fluctuations going on all the time where virtual particles and antiparticles live for a short time and then reannihilate. So I can draw the same sort of picture as I draw in a medium, but now with the axes being space and time instead of just space, just different directions in space. So if I have a positive test charge, which uh, just sits at one place in space, but lives along what we call its world line, moving along in time, uh, it will polarize the virtual particles, and we can have exactly the, sort of, the same sort of screening effect. So the normal expectation is that in any kind of theory that obeys the laws of quantum mechanics, one should have this kind of screening effect. And therefore, as one moves closer and closer to elementary particles, especially if they're strongly interacting, if there's a strong force among them, as we know the strong force has to be, uh, one should get big screening effects. That's certainly how it would be if the strong force were just a heftier version of ordinary electricity and magnetism. But what Taylor, Friedman, and Kendall saw, and what Feynman and Burkane were using, was no structure at short distances. So things weren't getting more complicated. One wasn't peeling away some screening to see a bigger and bigger charge at short distances. In fact, one was seeing something uh, with ideally simple properties at short distances. So instead of the implication, uh, I mean the implication of screening, which seemed to be the general phenomena one should expect in quantum field theory, is that the closer you look, the more complicated things should look. Uh, it, but the experiments showed a gift from heaven. The closer you looked, the simpler things behaved. So uh, one wanted a theory with the opposite behavior of anti-screening. Now, since the heuristic explanation I showed you of screening is so simple, uh, I hope you won't find it implausible that it's very difficult to find theories that have the opposite behavior. However, we found that there are such theories. In fact, there's almost only, in essence, there's only one such theory. So from this very, very general kind of consideration, one is led to almost a unique theory of what the strong interaction has to be. And it turns out that the theory uh, one is led to is a generalization 
of electromagnetism. It's now called quantum chromodynamics, or QCD, the essence of which is that unlike an, it's a generalization of electromagnetism, but with a very important twist, we'll come to in a moment, it's a generalization with three different kinds of charges. They're called colors. Of course, they have nothing to do with ordinary color. They're just three different kinds of charge. They also have nothing to do with electric charge. But they're, three, but they, they're the things that, uh, not that photons care about, but what gluons care about. Now, if one just had three copies of electromagnetism, one would still have screening and one wouldn't have uh, advanced at all in this problem. However, when you have three different colors, there's another, pot, there's another class of things that can happen. Not only can you have photons that respond individually to the color charges, but you also have the possibility of one color turning into another. And there's a richer theory, which is what QCD is, in which one includes not only gluons which sense the different charges, which would be analogous to the photons, but also other kinds of gluons which actually change one kind of color charge into another. So instead of having three photons, it turns out you have eight. And some quick-witted person should ask me later why there are not nine, but I will save that for a question. Now, that difference the, these, that possibility of one color changing into another and these new type, types of gluons change the qualitative theory of the, qualitative nature of the theory quite substantially. Because now, unlike in the case of photons, which are electrically neutral, the gluons themselves carry the charges. So, for instance, this gluon, which changes green charge into red charge, itself has one unit of green charge and minus one unit of red charge so that when it does the changing, the charges can be conserved. And the consequence of this, since that gluons respond to color charge and at the same time carry color charge, is that gluons interact with each other. Let me bring this down to earth a bit. Well, let me bring it closer to experience. <laughs> um, many of you have probably seen the movie Star Wars, the original one. Um, and laser sword fights play a very prominent role in Star Wars. Well, in the real world, laser, laser sword fights would be uh, very dubious affairs because photons don't interact with other photons. So these laser beams would just merrily pass right through one another. <laughs> of course, it's a futuristic movie, and uh, perhaps those lasers are actually lasing colored gluons. Then it would work. <laughs> With colored gluons, uh, they would really clash against each other. In fact, they produce very impressive explosions, presumably. <laughs> but there's a big difference. So photons just go through each other. The gluons interact with each other. And it's much more intricate, then, to understand what happens when you have the possibility of screening? Because the gluons, cannot, the gluons themselves can move around the charge, distribute it in different ways. And uh, if I had another hour, I could probably make it plausible to you that this phenomenon actually lives, leads to anti-screening. But uh, I'll have to leave it at that. It does, by calculation. <coughs> So one has gluons that interact with the, each other. And then the uh, interaction among the quarks, which is ultimately responsible for the existence of protons and mesons and the structure of all the strongly interacting particles, is supposed to be due at its core. Elementary, the elementary process that underlies it is simply the exchange of these colored gluons. So it's a sort of a vast but recognizable generalization of uh, what we know about in electrodynamics. Well, since this theory was formulated, 
It's been tested in many ways. Uh, one thing that's happened is we progressed from linear colliders to uh, circular ones. Much <laughs> and, uh, and higher energies. And at this uh, elect large electron positron ring near Geneva and at many other accelerators, one has been able to test the theory which was first invented just to understand uh, the, the Kendall et al. experiments to uh, work out its implications for all kinds of other experiments. And here you see what uh, to me is the most beautiful graph in all of physics, which indicates the data from a large number of different kinds of experiments. Each of these data, many of these data points represent the results of hundreds of ind independent measurements. And the anti-screening effect, which one can calculate in the theory, is the fact that this curve goes up this way. So that it, uh, well, at higher energies, which correspond to shorter distances, the effective strength of the strong interaction is getting smaller and smaller. So this, this one is plotted in, in increasing energy, which is uh, the same, it turns out, as smaller and smaller distances. So. We have, I think, uh, what's fair to call a compelling evidence that uh, this theory is the correct theory of the strong interaction. There's lots of data that agrees with it and nothing that contradicts it. It's had two, it's had several remarkable consequences uh, outside of the original problem of understanding the strong interaction. One is that cosmology, the study of the very early moments of the Big Bang, gets easy. It used to be very mysterious what would happen when you pressed matter closer and closer together, because we knew that protons and pro interacted in very uh, complicated ways with each other, and it seemed to be a very, that most, the most powerful force, and we had no idea what would happen under those circumstances. And in the Big Bang, uh, in the earliest moments of the Big Bang, one is concerned with the properties of matter at extraordinarily high uh, temperatures and densities, and that's precisely what wasn't known. But now we've learned that that's exactly when physics gets simple again. It's when the particles are close together or at high energies that the uh, effective uh, strength of the strong interaction, which was the difficult thing to treat, gets weak where you get inside those anti-screening clouds, the vast buildup of charge goes away, and you see the elementary charges, which are smaller. So cosmology has gotten much easier than it used to be, and with uh, remarkable results, including uh, the possibility of formulating the so-called inflationary model of the universe uh, due to Professor Guth here at MIT. Another thing that's happened is that it's been possible to formulate much more concrete ideas about the unification of all the forces of nature. This is due to two effects. First of all, as I've alluded to several times before, this theory of the strong interaction very much resembles the theory of electromagnetism. There's also a theory of the weak interaction, which I haven't said anything about. It's another interaction, which also resembles those two. They're all different, but, but you can see a family resemblance among them. Since they're mathematically so similar, they all involve gluons which act on different uh, kinds of charges. In fact, there are five different kinds of charges if you put them all together. It's hard to resist the temptation to imagine that there's a unified theory where you have gluons that change all five different kinds of charges into one another. The difficulty with that idea, at first sight, is that the strength of the different interactions uh, seems very different. That's why one of them is called the weak interaction, and another one is called the strong interaction. 
However, we've learned that the strength of the interaction you measure at some distance is not necessarily going to be its strength at another distance. And one has to do a calculation to extrapolate what the behavior is going to be when you get to the heart of the matter at very short distances. So one can still hope and test by calculation that the different interactions which look so different at the distances we measure might turn out to be the same at much smaller distances. And it turns out, to a remarkable extent, that works out. One can extrapolate this very same calculation that leads to the measured change in the couplings where we can measure it to much shorter distances. And then one finds that, indeed, the strong, weak, and electromagnetic interactions do become unified if, well, it works more or less if we include only the known particles. If we also include the supersymmetric particles, which are very popular, although not yet observed, uh, then they meet perfectly. So we're very encouraged that we're on the right track, both with the idea that the different forces get unified and with the idea that one should have supersymmetry. As an unexpected bonus, even gravity seems to uh, fall into place. So the story of the strong interaction has most unexpectedly had uh, ramifications in cosmology and the unification of the forces of nature. But there are also challenges and opportunities that remain in the study of the strong interaction itself that I think are no less remarkable. Uh, let me first mention two uh, slogans from John Wheeler, who's a physicist, a very uh, famous physicist at Princeton. I guess we regard him as our patron saint, similar to Vicki Weisskopf at uh, MIT. Uh, he's very uh, good at coining catchy phrases. And two that I really like and apply to QCD are it's from bits and mass without mass. It's from bits is the idea that ideally the laws of nature should calculate the properties of matter, it's, starting only from purely logical or mathematical properties. Bits. And that's, to a remarkable extent, realized in QCD. I showed you a selection from the table of the vast number of particles that have been observed. In QCD, the masses and properties of all those particles have to be explained from a theory that basically contains only two numbers. The number three, which is the number of colors, and the number two, which is the number of relevant quarks, that is the U and the D quark. So it really is its from bits. One has produced a vast amount of structure from purely logical and elementary numerical uh, properties. Of course, to get from those simple numbers, the three and the two, to this table requires a lot of processing in between. And some of the world's most elaborate uh, numerical simulations on massively, massively parallel teraflop computers have been uh, employed in that effort. Another of Wheeler's slogans is mass without mass. This refers to the idea that, uh, again, it's a E equals mc squared, or rather mc squared equals, or rather I should say m equals e over c squared, that you can get mass starting with pure energy without putting any mass in. That's exactly what happens in QCD, and is, is actually what we believe, what all sane physicists now believe, is uh, true of the proton, for instance. Most of the mass of the proton comes not from the mass of the things that are inside, but from the, from the energy in the fields that uh, bind them together. The quarks and the gluons have very small or, or zero masses. So 
implementing these slogans in detail to get from the ideal theory to concrete predictions about the world is an ongoing challenge which uh, is worthy and is receiving uh, of a great deal of effort. Another area in which we can hope to do much better, and we've uh, made remarkable progress in the last couple of years, is in the study of very dense matter. It turns out, perhaps not surprisingly, but in detail it is surprising, uh, that if you put, if you press quarks very close together, uh, things simplify and one can start to s actually solve the equations of QCD uh, fairly simply, whereas in general they're very difficult to solve and require massive numerical work. Um, well, this is extremely interesting work and has led to, uh, I think, a very beautiful result. Let me just try to give you the flavor of it by saying that the central prediction of this theory is that deep inside every neutron star, when the quarks get pressed really, really close together, uh, they look like a diamond. They become a transparent, insulating material. So it's the diamond inside, of, as big as the Ritz, inside each neutron star. So I think uh, the quest to understand the strong interaction, which started as sort of just unpeeling the next layer in the onion of uh, understanding the structure of matter, has been a truly remarkable success story in which Henry Kendall played a, a central role. It's a story that's not yet over, but I hope, I hope I've given you some flavor of what we've achieved so far. Thank you. Thank, thank, thank you, Frank, for a beautiful talk, um, and thank all the other, I thank all the other speakers today, the panelists, and also you who are there, who no are here to honor uh, Henry. With that, we'll close the meeting. <laughs>